With just over two weeks to go until Election Day, Democrat Nan Whaley is working to close the gap with incumbent Governor Mike DeWine and calling out what she says is a culture of corruption at the State House. And we've just dealt with it and said, oh, well, and it does not have to be this way. Senate hopefuls J.D. Vance and Tim Ryan are still in a dead heat heading into the home stretch. We have to do a better job. We need better federal leadership. This is an opportunity for us as a state really to send a signal to the rest of the country. Their pitch to voters before Ohioans decide who will replace Rob Portman in the U.S. Senate. Plus, Congressman Brad Wenstrup now has a district nearly double the size it was when he was elected. The issue is people that are out there every day trying to live their life, and they're having trouble doing that. The longest-running political show in central Ohio starts now. This is NBC4's The Spectrum with Colleen Marshall. The poll numbers are not good for Democrat gubernatorial candidate Nan Whaley, but with just over two weeks to go until Election Day, she is working harder than ever and says she is ready to be the next governor of Ohio. Welcome to The Spectrum. I'm Colleen Marshall. I interviewed Whaley this week at a political forum sponsored by the Columbus Metropolitan Club. As he has done for every forum and every debate invitation, Governor Mike DeWine declined to appear. So the stage was Whaley's. The number one issue for Ohioans, inflation. The cost of living is a burden to families. But realistically, what can the state do about this national problem? We've called uh, to do an inflation rebate with the $2.6 billion coming down from the federal government, a $350 inflation rebate to every working family uh, in the state, about 89% of Ohioans, to really help with the squeeze on gas and groceries. This isn't a liberal idea. This is an idea that Florida and Indiana have done. Whaley also favors an executive order to stop price gouging, saying Ohio is one of a handful of states where it is still legal for corporations to gouge consumers with no repercussions. And she wants to suspend the gas tax for six months. Whaley says she would also take action to deal with the fallout of the House Bill 6 bribery scandal. We've called on firing all the PUCO commissioners that needs to happen. We clearly have a system that is bought and sold by the utilities and being regulating themselves rather than having folks from the Consumer Council or having folks from Renewable Energy on the PUCO and making sure that we have more representative uh, effort on that council. Whaley points out that the FBI has identified Ohio as one of the most corrupt state houses in the nation. And she says it's nothing new. And we've just dealt with it and said, oh, well, and it does not have to be this way. You know, if we were sitting here four years ago, the big discussion were the electronic classrooms of tomorrow or ECOT, where they had a big donor who had an idea of virtual classrooms. They let him do this, and he sucked money out of our public school systems. Six years ago, it was the payday lenders who wanted to charge, and they let them, exorbitant interest rates that drove foreclosures in communities and neighborhoods that I live in and affected, again, families and communities. Over and over again at that state house, you, some, you see a big donor with a terrible idea where Ohioans pay. I want to give you a chance to respond to some of the things that voters see every day in commercials that are attack ads against you. And we're all used to attack ads and it's like, well, what do we believe? What do we not believe? Among the things that are being said about you is that you were a failed mayor. My mother takes great offense to that one. <laughs> so look, I'm proud of my time as mayor. Uh, I was president of the United States Conference of Mayors, and uh, we saw over a billion dollars of investment in our city without a partner at the State House, I might add. So we're really proud of that work. We had, in 2016, I talk about it a lot, a uh, high quality universal preschool for every single four year old. It was so popular and did so well that we added every three year old as well. It's become a national best practice. Fancy cities like Santa Barbara come to Dayton to figure out preschool. It's something I'm really proud of, the work we're doing to get kids kindergarten ready and also make sure that people have access to childcare, which is a key workforce issue, something that should be scaled statewide. Dayton voters voted for that. 
They voted for this. I was supported it so we could have investment in preschool, but it was a vote by the people of Dayton. That's what they're discussing there. Secondly, I'm proud that we actually, during my time as mayor, increased the number of police officers that are on the, on, uh, at the city of Dayton. We know we need more police officers. Every mayor that I talk to, particularly every mayor in the state of Ohio knows, this is why we fought for the American Rescue Plan money, because we wanted to make sure that we could have police and fire services. We also talked about abortion. Whaley is pro-choice and says the majority of Ohioans agree with her that the state should return to the protections of Roe v. Wade. I've been very clear, too, that the first thing we would do once we're elected is work to put Roe in the Ohio Constitution so it will be codified and no extremists can take away a right that we had, that my mother fought for, that my niece doesn't have. This is the position of the majority of Ohioans. Over 60% of Ohioans want Roe versus Wade. And let me be clear for folks that don't understand the abortion discussion, Roe has limits. Those were the limits around viability that were the law of the land my entire life until this summer. That's what Ohio women deserve. That's what we would fight to, for. And that's what the majority of Ohioans believe. So why do you think the polls show you so far behind Mike DeWine? Well, I don't if know if this is an okay. issue that's important to Ohio voters, why do most polls have him double digits ahead of you in this race? Well, I don't know if you've heard, but he's been on the ballot since I was 10 months old. And so he has a lot of name recognition. <laughs> You know, the guy's been in office for 46 years. Uh, and so I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, and look, I think, you know, this has been a shock to our system and to women and the men who support women in our state. When June 24th happened, it was tough for all American women, but for Ohio women, it was devastating. We saw what Mike DeWine did seven hours after Roe fell. He made sure the six-week abortion ban went in place. And we saw what that meant in this city. A 10-year-old in Columbus who was raped had to go to Indiana, to Indiana, to terminate a pregnancy. When Mike DeWine was asked about it, he said he doubted if she existed, and if she existed, she was lying. Now, once Columbus police arrested her rapist and he confessed, Mike DeWine has two words, and you know what they are, Colleen, they're no comment, because he doesn't want to talk to the Ohio voters and the Ohio people because his position is so out of step. With just 16 days to go until that midterm election, the race for U.S. Senate is still in a dead heat. Republican candidate J.D. Vance and Democrat candidate Tim Ryan both asking voters to be their voice and spread the word about their campaigns. While Ryan is focusing on some issues like energy and climate change, he assured voters this week he will work across the aisle if elected to the U.S. Senate. Vance doubled down on his top three priorities, inflation reduction, border security, and making sure law enforcement is empowered to do their jobs. But each candidate hanging the final weeks on their campaign messages. The final argument that I'm making down the stretch here is Tim Ryan had his chance, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi have had their chance, and it just hasn't worked. We're going to spend the next three weeks really highlighting that um, He's not Ohio. Like, this guy is absolutely bought and paid for before he even gets into the Senate. This race won't only decide who will replace the outgoing Republican Senator Rob Portman. It could be pivotal for determining which party is going to hold the majority in the U.S. Senate. In the last two years, U.S. Representative Brad Wenstrup's district has grown from eight counties to 15. When we come back, I ask the congressman where he stands on issues like abortion, Taiwan, and the top issues facing voters that he's talking to when we come back. Ohio's 2nd District Republican Congressman Brad Wenstrup is running for re-election, but he will be in front of thousands of voters for the first time because his district has expanded. When Ohio lost a congressional district, all the others shifted. District 2 went from eight counties near Cincinnati to parts of 15 counties, stretching from Hamilton County all the way to Ross County, parts of Chillicothe. He faces Democrat Samantha Meadows next month. I talked to him this week about his record and his plans. 
everything costs more. The supply chain is still clogged, and Brad Wenstrup says people will vote on kitchen table issues. They're concerned about energy and the energy cost and energy availability. And so that's number one and two, because that's what they need on a daily basis. Wenstrup has been in Congress since 2013. He's a physician, was a military doctor. He is fiercely pro-life. I look at this child in the womb as its own unique individual, and I do from conception. And, you know, it's that, that child is not that mother, not that father. It's their own unique individual, and I want to protect their rights every, every step of the way. And so I, I don't consider um, it to be health care, actually. So just to get you on the record, do you believe in exceptions for rape? Uh, actually, I prefer that we not. What I like to do and what I've been involved with and my wife as well is helping those that find themselves in a difficult pregnancy, whether it's rape, doesn't matter. Incest? Uh, um, same situation. Why can we not help the mother get through a situation? Would you support abortion for the life of the mother? That's not abortion. That's a life-saving procedure. Wenstrup voted to certify the results of the 2020 election because, he says, the Constitution requires certification when states send in their ballots. But as for the January 6th Insurrection Committee, do you think he should testify and do you think he lost that election? Well, from what I understand, he says he's more than happy to testify. And when it comes to whether he won or lost, I'm never going to be able to get into each and every state and dig into what may have happened. But I do have concerns concerns about what the last election is was the Constitution upheld. There are people listening this morning who are have the chance to vote for you for the very first time because of the shift in the district boundaries. So what's the one thing that you want voters to know about you? Well, first of all, I'll give you a little bit of my background if you don't know me. Uh, so I'm a physician. At an early age, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. Um, but I, I had great admiration for our military. Ronald Reagan had really brought that out in America, to have respect for the military and the works that they have done, especially the greatest generation. So in 1998, um, at a later age, I called 1-800-USA-ARMY and joined the Army Reserve as um, our country kept getting attacked. Then 9-11, happened. I go to Iraq and I serve as chief of surgery at Abu Ghraib prison where we not only took care of our troops but I took care of the enemy and when I came home I gave a talk about my tour and then I started getting asked to speak at different places and people kept saying you ought to run for office. Is there enough time left between now and the election day for Nan Whaley to close the gap with Governor DeWine? Our all-star roundtable weighs in when we come back. Welcome back. In our roundtable this week, we have Democrat strategist Derek Clay and Republican Bob Clegg back with us. And we talked earlier in this program about Nan Whaley. I mm -hmm. talked, I interviewed her this week at the Metropolitan Club. And, and the reality, Derek, is your party doesn't seem to be giving her as much backing as maybe they should. And she is so far down in the polls. Have, have you just counted her out? Well, I don't think that... Uh anybody should be counting anybody out at this at this stage of the game I mean we we still have you know a couple of weeks until the election and I think Nan is is running on on the Democratic platform and she's she's running the best race that she knows how she is running what I would consider otherwise other than the fact that there's so much name recognition for Mike DeWine she's running a pretty strong campaign and when I spoke with her this week I was thinking there wasn't an issue that I questioned her about that she didn't have a soft Solid answer for sure and as you're saying she sounds like a Democrat she yeah. sounds like what the Democratic Party should be pushing and that's her problem because she sounds like a Democrat and she's um, she's you know talking about abortion which is their one issue that they're always going to talk about even though it's not the top issue for the vast majority of people not only here in Ohio but nationwide but she's sounding like a Democrat and we're in a Republican state so the poll numbers are pretty much reflecting I think what the electorate is out there but I have to hand it to her she is being genuine and uh, that can't be said about some other candidates that are running this year 
but she's being genuine on a number of issues. The other thing that she's talking about, Derek, and I think maybe people aren't paying the amount of attention that your party thought they would be paying, mm -hmm. is the corruption at the state house. We have the FBI saying it's the most corrupt state house in the country. Yeah. Why isn't that more of an issue for voters? We saw what happened with House Bill 6. We know bribes were accepted, given sure. and accepted. Sure. You know, I think a lot of folks are paying attention to their pocketbooks because of, uh, of inflation, you know, as a, as a result of some of the Trump policies that we have this, this massive inflation that we're dealing with right now. And, you know, the corruption at the state house seems like it's over there. Right. And it's not in people's face. It was headlines, at least to political folks like us for the last few years. But now it seems like it's so far away. It's not in people's everyday yeah. life. But it, Colleen, the Democrats have a problem with that issue, because remember, they put Larry Householder in as speaker. It was Democrat votes that mm -hmm. did it. Dave Leland held the Bible to swear in yeah. Householder. They, they but Larry Householder was the one that had his hand out for $60 million. And <laughs> they needed Democrat <laughs> votes to pass House Bill 6. If the Democrats had not, if Amelia Sykes had not cut a deal with Larry Householder, House Bill 6 wouldn't have passed. They wouldn't have gotten any but, of that. But it we, was, we don't want to confuse things. It's Republicans accused of taking Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. yeah, absolutely. And I also want to move on if I can to the Senate race uh, you know statistically we see oh Vance is up and another poll I saw had had Brian up by two points it is a dead heat so why isn't the Democratic Party in Washington supporting Tim Ryan the way the Republican Party in Washington is supporting JD Vance Mitch McConnell gave him $44 million. Sure listen he needed $44 million because he's running a terrible campaign if, if he didn't have $44 million, he wouldn't have money to, to, to spend on this station and others. He's running a terrible campaign. I don't think that it's too late for the Democratic Party to get involved in this race. They're watching it very closely because it is so close. I see you rolling your yes, eyes over there. Yes, they're not. You, we should, uh, you know, in fairness, we should tell people you are involved uh, with, with lining up political ads. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. I'm one career? of those mean people that put those <laughs> ads out there that, that your station loves. But anyways. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, that you follow the money and everything. And if they really thought, the Democrats, if Chuck Schumer thought that he was going to win, be able to win this race in Ohio, he would have dumped money in it already. He has dumped $17 million in Wisconsin, and the last poll showed Ron Johnson, the Republican incumbent, up by six. And they're still spending money there, but they won't spend a dime here. It, it you, does seem odd because Tim Ryan has run what everybody says is a pretty solid campaign. He's running a solid campaign but you have you also have to remember that there are very tight races in Georgia there's a very tight race in Pennsylvania and so the the uh, DSCC the Democratic Senatorial Committee campaign committee is looking at all these races yeah now before we go to break I want to show the two of you something there was a big sign at broad and high basically calling out Governor Mike DeWine for not debating Nan Whaley when we come back I want your opinion on his refusal to debate but also your opinion on signs like this pressure on Mike DeWine and we'll be right back Welcome back. Well, we're going to show you this sign again. It was at Broad and High this week, and essentially it's a big challenge to Mike DeWine. Why aren't you willing to debate the first female major party candidate for governor? The big question, why? Not from her campaign, but from a women voting group, Women Rise. So why isn't Mike DeWine debating, and is this criticism valid? Um, Colleen, he's been on the statewide ballot now for 30 years. He has held lieutenant governor, U.S. senator, attorney general, and now governor. I think everybody knows every single position that Mike DeWine has taken on all the issues. They know where he's at on abortion. He hasn't been shy about that. They know about him creating jobs. I mean, there's nothing new here to find out. All this is is to give more attention to Nan Whaley because she doesn't have the money but and debates this give free part attention. of the democratic process, and I'll ask you this, Derek, every candidate, shouldn't they have to defend their record? Aren't there questions to ask him about the corruption at the state house when he was at the top seat, what he knew, when he knew it, things that we don't ordinarily get to talk to him about. Absolutely. I, you know, any candidate that's running for office should debate and, and defend their position. 
you know, he has been on the ballot for 30 years, but the bottom line is he's on the ballot again this year for re-election for governor. And so he's taken many uh, policy positions. The public should know about what those policy positions are, what his thinking was behind those policy positions, and, and how he's going to move forward with future policy And decisions. compare the two candidates side by side to see how what he's saying stacks up against how she's saying. Because the I voters, mean, I mean sure. I'm coming from this, from the position of, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, yeah. you should be able to defend your record and talk to the people with unscripted questions, unscripted answers, not your canned Commercial, yeah. com commercials. But in politics, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> the voters and lose. That's, the voters that's lose. That's the problem. And we will see you next week on The Spectrum.